we're going to begin tonight. There's so many things going on. I want to get to something very, very serious. But first, this is serious also, but you think it was a joke. If you went down to New Orleans during the course of all the problems that have existed over the last couple of weeks or so, and you tried to get a generator or something else from FEMA, if you tried to get something that would help you uh, weather the storm and to make it through the floods and so forth, you find that you probably would have a very, very difficult time. So what would you do? Well, if you visit the Walmart or the Sam's Club stores there, you find shoppers who have been without power for weeks, marveling that there are still generators in stock and priced at only $300. And an article in the Tallahassee Democrat uh, lays all this out. Actually, it's not New Orleans. It's Tallahassee, uh, Florida. And I'm sorry, we're talking about when Hurricane Katrina went through there, and you couldn't get anything from the official agencies. But as I say, if you visited the Walmart Sam's Club stores there in Tallahassee, you'd get everything you need. Uh, trucks rolled right in after the hurricane and stuffed the stores and with chainsaws and boots for rescue workers, uh, sheets, clothes, uh, shelter, uh, uh, available for shelter, water and ice for the public. And Rayshon Smith, who was shopping with his three children at Walmart on Saturday, said this was the only place you could find water these first few days. I still haven't managed to get through the FEMA. It's hard to say, but you get more justice at FEMA, a at Walmart. In 1997, Congress gave FEMA $500,000 and ordered it to develop a comprehensive plan to evacuate New Orleans. The agency passed on the money to Louisiana, which used it instead to study building a new bridge. As Rita Beamish of the Associated Press reported, FEMA didn't bother making sure a plan was drawn up. And Aide DeWitt said its job had just been to pass on the money. Now, how often do you suppose someone at Walmart headquarters to spend $500,000 and doesn't bother keeping track of it? It's legendary for tracking every transaction and pinching every penny at Walmart. David Bitter, the Republican senator from Louisiana, was so impressed with the rapid response of Walmart and other companies that he promised to introduce a bill to abolish FEMA and contract his job out to the private sector. I'm afraid the Walmart Emergency Management Agency is going to be a tough sell on Capitol Hill. But David Bitter, the Republican senator, says he votes for WEMA, Walmart Emergency Management Association, every time. Well, just one more example of how the free market responds where the government doesn't. Well, I'd like to talk to you about something a little more serious and a little more, and a little more permanent. And that is the whole concept uh, that I think of as the delusion of force. You know, the simplest way to define a libertarian I think, is as a person who opposes government involvement wherever possible. A libertarian is someone who wants to get government out of your life. A libertarian wants to get government out of as many current programs as possible, and he opposes any new government program. But why? Why does a libertarian oppose government activity? Because government is force. Every government activity involves the use of force, forcing people to do what they haven't chosen to do, forcibly preventing people from doing what they have chosen to do, and or forcing people to pay for activities they don't want to pay for. And the force that's used is the same kind of violence that is so useful for robbing money from 7-Eleven stores. Men with guns cart off the prison to people who don't comply with the government's will. But why does a libertarian oppose force? Because there's a sense that it's inherently wrong to use violence to get what you want and because force doesn't provide a permanent solution to anything. Those who are forced to change their behavior by the violence will look for ways to fight back, or to evade the force and resume their previous behavior. As a result, programs built on force provide no lasting solution. Force, however, can be a siren song. It can appear to provide a quick and simple solution to a current problem. Why spend endless days and nights trying to convince people that what you think is right, when a simple application of force can clear up the matter in an instant. In addition, government force has become a staple of our society. The fact that every government program contains force is ignored. We're not even recognized. The attitude of let the government take care of us allows an individual to bypass the serious work of finding a real solution to a problem. I was in the hospital recently. While I was there, a nurse named Kathleen Brazil said, and I paraphrase slightly, Government is a way of not having to think. I think she summed up the problem perfectly. The government can take care of things, so why not just let it do so? And so all the pressures of society seem to mount up in favor of using the force of government to deal with whatever is the problem of the day. To try to resist those pressures can seem to be useful as well as unpopular. 
Thus, the libertarians are frequently put in the position of having to oppose the popular remedy to some social problems. I think the quintessential example of this occurred after September 11, 2001. After 9-11, the siren song, of course, was out in full blast. People wanted our government to use force. People wanted our government to strike back with all the violence possible to do something about those who had created the disaster of 9-11. What happened as a result of that? Well, let's look at that and see after we return from these special announcements. We were talking about use of force and why libertarians oppose it, and I said that the quintessential example of, uh, or the quintessential test of libertarian principles, I think, came with 9-11 in 2001. And because of uh, 9-11, the, uh, everybody was put to the test, I think. And libertarians fell into three categories. But before I describe those three categories, I want to say that logic itself, rather than libertarian principles, spoke out against what our government was doing. Our government was going to retaliate for 9-11 by attacking Afghanistan. Well, uh, libertarians are not opposed to retaliation, to defensive force, to uh, trying to fight back when somebody attacks you. But simple logic tells you that if you hit me in the nose and I respond by attacking your sister, that's not retaliation. That's aggression. Because your sister didn't attack you. And Afghanistan did not attack you. The Taliban did not attack you. Osama bin Laden attacked America, or at least that's what we were told. And if Osama bin Laden attacked America, then it was Osama bin Laden that needed to be retaliated against. And it meant that what was necessary was to go off and find Osama bin Laden, capture him, and bring him to the United States and take him to trial, just the way Timothy McVeigh was taken to trial as a result of the Oklahoma terrorist bomb. Now, when that idea was raised in September of 2001, a lot of people poo-pooed it and said, well, wait, wait, wait. Well, what if you don't capture Osama bin Laden? Then what, huh? huh? Well, it's almost four years later, and Osama bin Laden hasn't been captured by any means. So why were people laughing at the idea of trying to capture him in 2001 as an alternative to bombing Afghanistan? The problem was that a lot of innocent people were killed in Afghanistan in 2001 and 2002 and continued to be killed there. People who are other people's sons, daughters, fathers, mothers, sisters, brothers, uh, friends, neighbors, all these people died. And for what? There's no logic to it whatsoever because it was not retaliating against the people who attacked the world space center. But let's get back to libertarians again. Libertarians, I think, fell into three categories right after 9-11. First were the group of those who said that force is wrong and that libertarian principles uh, were not in, could not be uh, employed to try to get America to attack Afghanistan that America could not use force uh, according to libertarian principles. There are those who said, in the second group, who said that America should use force, that it was all right to retaliate against Afghanistan, even though Afghanistan had not created the problem. As a matter of fact, the Taliban told the United States government that it would turn over Osama bin Laden if the United States government provided evidence that Osama bin Laden was behind uh, the attack on the World Trade Center. And, of course, the United States government did not provide any such evidence. But the second group said, yes, America was right to attack Afghanistan, and uh, there are no two ways about it, and so uh, it is right to go to war against Afghanistan. The third group, however, probably did not believe that America was right to attack Afghanistan, but felt that the prevailing winds were such that the pressures were so great that America do attack Afghanistan that it was wrong for libertarians to oppose the attack on Afghanistan. And I have to tell you, I received a number of emails in late September of 2001 from people who said that I was hurting the libertarian cause by saying that 9-11 was not the start of all this, that America had, uh, the American government had brought this on the American people by its foreign policy. And uh, these people who wrote to me, who apparently were libertarians, and said that I had no business speaking for libertarians, and I never claimed to speak for all libertarians. But I have no business doing this because I was going to bring the wrath of God down on libertarians for saying that uh, our government was involved in all of this. And, of course, the usual cliches were trotted out, anti-American, blame America for, and all of that. But the truth of the matter is that America did not bring 9-11 down on our heads. It was our government, not just the government of George Bush or even the government of Bill Clinton or the government of George H.W. Bush or the government of Ronald Reagan, but governments going all the way back to Franklin Roosevelt. And it's important to realize that if you know you have done something wrong, you do not make things better by compounding the evil 
by continuing to do what is wrong, by attacking people who have not attacked. But again, we come back to this bad reaction that many libertarians had to the idea of exercising security, of standing up for libertarian principles and saying, we are not going to attack somebody as an attack does. Again, we must realize that the act of bringing down the World Trade Center was, an act, was a crime and not an act of war. And the Bush administration, of course, has used this concept of it being an act of war as an excuse for all sorts of crimes of its own. It uses it to uh, bomb and rape and attack with missiles innocent people. It uses it to have civil liberties restrictions, even though the Constitution does not... Uh, in any way whatsoever, suspend civil liberties during the time of war. Uh, it uses it uh, to impose all kinds of new spending on America without in any way whatsoever cutting back on other spending and saying that we need to cut that other spending in order to make way for war spending. Uh, and so what we have here is an excuse, a gigantic excuse for our government to create all sorts of problems for us. Now, there are consequences of this that I want to talk about when we come back from this uh, break. All right, we were talking about uh, 9-11 and the fact that there were three groups of libertarians after 9-11, those who thought we should stand by principle and point out that it was American foreign policy that caused the problem and that America should not retaliate by going to war against Afghanistan when the people of Afghanistan had done nothing, nothing whatsoever to facilitate uh, the 9-11 uh, World Trade Center Tower disaster. And the second group of people were those that thought we should fight uh, uh, Afghanistan because that's what George Bush said we should do and we should support our president and so forth. And the third group of people were libertarians who felt that even though it was probably wrong what George Bush was doing, it would be unpopular to oppose him and that it would bring disrespect upon libertarians if we were to oppose uh, George Bush and also if we were to bring up past foreign policy at a time when so many people were grieving uh, their loved ones uh, about 9-11. Now, I believe that it was right for libertarians to stand by principle to say that this was the fault of the United States government, that those 3,000 people in New York died because of our government, not because of America, not because uh, America is bad or America is wrong, but because our government has been wrong for the last 70 years. And I think that it is very, very important that libertarians stand up for what is right, even when it is unpopular. What has happened in the four years since 2001? Well, first of all, we've had a war in Iraq, which continues, and most Americans realize that that war was wrong, that we never should have gotten into the war in Iraq, even though in 2002 and 2003, most Americans believed it was right to get into war with Iraq. But libertarians who stood fast and said that it was wrong have been proven to be right. And people are, I think, paying a little more attention to those who stood up and said that it was wrong to get involved in Iraq. I also believe that a lot more people realize today than did in 2001, that it was wrong to get into war in Afghanistan. Anybody who pays attention to what's going on in Afghanistan knows that the warlords have taken over the country, that the so-called president who was elected in the so-called free elections in Afghanistan is being protected by American troops, and if he were not being protected by American troops, he'd be assassinated in a moment, that there is no semblance of democracy or constitutional government in Afghanistan that nothing has changed there. And as a matter of fact, that drug stealing has taken over, opium growing has taken over in Afghanistan. And in fact, the American government is faced with a dilemma. Either they shut down the opium growing, in which case it will be a very unpopular act in Afghanistan, or they allow it to continue contrary to American policy here at home. Government policies always run into each other eventually. And that's what's happening in Afghanistan now with the United States in control. In any event, I believe it has been right for libertarians to stand and stand uh, firmly for what they believe. I think it is right for libertarians who have stood all these years against the drug war. I believe it is right for libertarians who have stood all these years against the gun laws. I believe it is right for libertarians who have opposed the prescription drug medicine program of George Bush. I believe it is right for libertarians to have, uh, to have opposed all the education policies of Bill Clinton, George Bush, and other American presidents. I believe that it is right for libertarians to stand on principle always. If we don't stand on principle, who's going to? If we don't stand on principle, who's going to point out what the right policy is? Who's going to point out what would actually make things work? Who's going to point out what would make health care better in America? 
who's going to point out that if we get government out of schooling entirely, we have a ghost of a chance of creating a good education system in America, whereas now we have no chance whatsoever. Only libertarians are going to do that. And only libertarians can do that if libertarians stand firmly on principles and only if libertarians are consistent. You can't be consistent by saying force is wrong here, but force is all right there. It isn't right. It is never right. You know, so often the question comes up, uh, I've been on a lot of talk shows over the years, obviously, and so often the question has come up about, uh, well, you know, you libertarians, you want to privatize uh, the streets? How are you going to operate the streets without government? Who's going to pay for them? So forth and so on. And it can seem to back libertarians in a corner to where you want to say, uh, well, I'm not in favor of, uh, of uh, privatizing the streets. That would be too extreme or something else. But all you have to say is, well, I have no doubt that if the streets were privately owned and operated, they would be much more efficient, much safer, and much more comfortable to drive on than they are today. But that's not an issue right now. Right now, we've got bigger things to worry about, a $2.7 trillion government and other things that are of immediate concern. You don't have to, to back away from anything. We have a, uh, an email from Bob Outside of Space that says that given that Bush has proposed whatever it takes to pay for Katrina, would you explain to me how we would be better off if U.S. citizens' personal savings rates were positive and not negative? Uh, a positive savings rate means that America is saving more than it is borrowing uh, from foreign countries and uh, from people in the United States itself. And you, of course, within the United States, you just have to have a balance of uh, savings and borrowing because the borrowing can only come from savings, but sometimes it comes from overseas. Anyway, right now the savings rate is negative, and uh, Bob wants to know, how we would be better off if the savings rates were positive. How does having billions of dollars in personal savings in the bank help to mitigate the problem of the government responding to a disaster such as Katrina? Would that help the government keep from deficit spending related to this disaster? No, it would not, because the government would have to borrow the money from those who have these savings. It would have to sell bonds, and you would have to take the money out of your savings account and use it to buy long-term treasury bonds or even short-term treasury securities, and the deficit would be just as bad as it is now. So it would not be a different problem. You know, returning to the uh, to the question of force, uh, I remember back in I guess it was about a year or so ago, Wolf Blitzer, uh, one of CNN's star reporters, was on the Daily Show with John Stewart. And I've mentioned the Daily Show before. John Stewart is a very funny guy, and they have very very funny writers on that show. And they are one show that holds the politicians' feet to the fire. And not just the politicians, but the media, the television networks. And as a result of the Iraqi war, a lot of people have died. Tens of thousands of innocent Iraqis have died, and almost a thousand Americans have died. And when Wolf Blitzer was on the show, John Stewart asked him how the government could be so wrong and how the media could be so wrong in not asking the right questions to hold the government's feet to the fire. And Wolf Blitzer said, well... We made a mistake. You know, don't you ever make a mistake? And Stewart said, well, of course I made a mistake. But how could you make a mistake this gigantic? And Wolf Blitzer said, well, you know, it's oops, oops. No, we made a mistake. Oops, oops, we made a mistake. And the very statement belies exactly how these people in the press and in government treat human lives. Tens of thousands of people died, and Wolf Blitzer, with a smile on his face, what in lower circles would be called a certain kind of grin, says, oops, we made a mistake. Isn't that funny? Yeah, it's funny that people's brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers and sons and daughters die in bombings and missile attacks and in uh, uh, checkpoint shooting and in a massacre in Fallujah. Yes, that's very, very funny. And it turns out that there was no reason to go to war in Iraq in the first place. No terrorists, no weapons of mass destruction. Uh, no mobile laboratories, no anything. And yet the media could not in any way ask the question that would have made it plain that the government had no evidence. You know, I've covered this before, but I can't seem to get myself satisfied that I've covered it often enough. And that is that George Bush was not mistaken about 9-11. If I tell you there's a dragon out in the hall, and as soon as you go out in the hallway, that dragon's going to eat you up, and I know that that dragon is there. And it turns out there's no dragon there. I wasn't mistaken. I lied to you. Because I, was, I said I was certain. I said I knew that there was a dragon out there. And I didn't know. I couldn't know if there was no dragon there in the first place. And George Bush could not have known that there were weapons of mass destruction in 
Iraq because he had no evidence of it, and therefore he lied to us when he said he did. Colin Powell lied. Maybe he lied because George Bush told him uh, these things, and he relied on what George Bush said. But these were lies. Lies should be the province of impeachment, not the province of school. Well, we'll be back in a minute with our final segment of the first hour, but then we have a whole second hour to go. Going back to New Orleans. I guess we're going back to New Orleans. Well, I'm going back to the subject of New Orleans. Uh, there was a very funny uh, article by Joe Chembry on lootlockwell.com in which he mentioned that George Bush said in his speech, we will rebuild this great city no matter the cost. And Congress has already authorized $62 billion for the flood disaster needs, and now the politicians are talking about $200 billion as a net expenditure. $200 billion. And Chambray says, does anyone in the federal government realize how close it's come to paving the streets of New Orleans with gold? Just divide $200 billion in reconstruction money by the 1 million residents of the city, and you get $200,000 for every man, woman, and child in New Orleans. For a typical suburban family of four, that means $800,000. You can not only rebuild their home, but raise it and rebuild it. Raise it and rebuild it. And then raise it and rebuild it again until you'd have money left over. It's easy enough to understand where the floodwaters went, but just where is the flood of money going? And Chambry says, let's pretend that we mutated into socialists, and our sense of guilt compels us to upgrade everyone's living quarters. But come on, million-dollar homes for welfare mothers with four children? Even the looniest Swedish social democrat wouldn't go there. So right along with that, uh, House Majority Leader Tom DeLay was asked, aren't you going to cut something out of the federal budget to make room for these expenditures for New Orleans? And he says, there is simply no fat left cut in the federal budget that Republicans have done so well in cutting spending that he declared an ongoing victory against waste in the federal government. So that $2.5 trillion government that we have now is lean and mean and a fighting machine. And when asked if that meant that the government was running at peak efficiency, Soleil said, yes, after 11 years of Republican majority, we've pared it down pretty good. Amazing. It is amazing how these people delude themselves, delude themselves into believing that they are budget cutters that they believe in smaller government, that somehow or other they have done what they said they were going to do back in 1994 when they took over Congress, that they are going to, that they have actually reduced government. Well, I'm sorry, but reducing government means going from 7 to 5, not from 7 to 9. I talked about uh, Wolf Blitzer on The Daily Show, and one of the things he said in defense of his network, not the... Uh, being more skeptical of what George Bush said, was that the whole world thought that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. But nobody seemed to ask the simple, obvious question. How did the whole world arrive at the conclusion that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction? Because George Bush told them so. George Bush and Colin Powell and Dick Cheney, and I suppose Donald Rumsfeld got in there somewhere too, all said that they had evidence that Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. And so naturally, the United Nations, then Russia, and Germany, and France, and all these countries thought that, the, uh, that Hussein had weapons of mass destruction, and the only argument was over what should be done about it. Well, so be it. Um, the war continues, however, in Iraq, despite the fact that uh, it has now proven to be not just a fraud, but a failure. That it has not brought democracy to Iraq, it has not brought peace and stability to the Middle East, it has not ended terrorist activities, it has not done any of the things that it was supposed to do. And it's interesting how wars follow similar patterns over and over and over again. I've spoken before on this show about World War One. There are so many things that happened in World War One that were repeated in World War Two and in the Korean War and in the Vietnam War and now in the Iraq War. And one of them is the people who are charged with conspiracy to interfere with recruiting. It is not against the law to be opposed to the war in Iraq, but it is against the law to interfere with the recruiting of troops in the Army, Navy, Marines, the Coast Guard, or whatever. And sometime back in Bingham, New York, the trial, a trial began for what is called the St. Patrick Four. Four anti-war activists who faced conspiracy charges for spilling their own blood inside a military recruiting station to protect the Iraqi war. Uh, what happened is they went in there and they had some of their own blood, I guess, in a jar and spilled it on the floor. And Daniel Burns, one of the defendants, said, we wanted to make visible the truth of war. We were called by our faith, the law, and our moral beliefs to equally protect the war. Well, they were then uh, arrested and charged with uh, desecration of property and so on. And it's interesting that in World War I, people were not arrested for opposing World War I so much as they were arrested for interfering with recruiting, with trying to talk young people out of joining the army. 
or signing up for the draft or whatever it may be. And a state court jury refused to convict them once the peace activists convinced the jury that their actions were consistent with international law. I don't know the details of that, but the activists, I do know the activists argued that the, 19, uh, that the 2003 invasion of Iraq was illegal under international law because it was not approved by the United Nations. Now, that's something that you or I might not stand up and cheer about, but they did it, and so they were acquitted. But then the federal government got involved this year, and the four protesters are now being charged under federal law and face up to six years in prison and $275,000 in fines. And um, uh, they had admitted from the beginning that they went into the recruiting center, that they knelt down, that they read a very powerful statement, and then they poured their blood around the vestibule of the recruiting center, including on the American flag. And they've admitted that ever since... But they've admitted it ever since they did it. And they're proud of it. They knelt and they prayed and they were taken away and arrested. Now, instead of facing misdemeanor charges of trespass or minor damage to property, they are being challenged by a very expansive statute that has been rarely used in the history of this country, charging them with conspiracy by force, intimidation, or threat to interfere with a federal officer, a recruiting officer. And uh, that statute, as I said, contains punishments up to six years in prison and a quarter of a million dollars in fines. Unfortunately, the prosecutor and the judge have agreed consistently throughout the trial to make it easier and easier and easier for the jury to convict them, and much more difficult for the jury to stand up and be part of what we might call the conscience of this country and say no to the war in Iraq. So uh, that's going on now, a uh, replay of World War I. Um, I mentioned earlier that by agreeing to what President Bush has done, we are agreeing to let the use of force reign in this country. And we have an ongoing case here of Jose Padilla, whom I've spoken of before, but not perhaps in the last six months or so. Uh, on, uh, let's see, when was it? Back in 2002. Let, let me back up a little. Jose Padilla was, is an American citizen who went to uh, Afghanistan and trained with the uh, Al-Qaeda and came back here. And uh, he was arrested by the American government. And the American government decided that he was an enemy of that and that he had no right to an attorney. He had no right to a day in court. That as an enemy combatant, he could be held without trial, held without being charged with a crime, for as long as the war on terror should last. And that war on terror, of course, is bound to last for the rest of our lives because there's no way that you can end a war on terror. But in 2002, U.S. Judge Michael Mukasey decided that Padilla must have access to an attorney, and so he assigned him one. The attorney requested that the judge vacate the warrant against Padilla since Padilla had not been charged with any specific crime. And at that point, it was that the Bush administration declared Padilla an enemy combatant and took him to a naval brig in South Carolina where he now remains without access to a lawyer. He said he has no access to the press, no access to his family, no access to the outside world at all. And Padilla had been accused of plotting with al-Qaeda to explode a dirty bomb in the United States. Eventually, the government stopped accusing him of that and instead claimed he wanted to blow up apartment buildings with natural gas. Of course, you can only suspect that with the story shifting so much, the evidence might not withstand the scrutiny and cross examination of the jury trial. This February of this year, federal court in South Carolina ruled that the Bush administration could not legally hold Padilla as an enemy combatant without charging him with a crime. And by overruling that, uh, well, let me wait now until we come back from this break, because the Fourth Circuit of Appeals has now stepped in and thrown paid to that. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes, and I'll interrupt my commentary about uh, Jose Padilla long enough to take a phone call from Gordon in Pennsylvania. Good evening, Gordon. Hi, Harry. Um, if it isn't prying too much, could you give us some um, sense of your medical condition and how you're doing since your hospitalization? I, I don't have any personal relationship with you, of course, but I have a sense of apprehension and uh, worry uh, normally reserved for lifelong friends. Well, I appreciate that. Actually, I never have really given any kind of uh, uh, comprehensive uh, tale of uh, what exactly happened. I'll make it as brief as possible that uh, early this year in June, I developed a tremendous pain in my right leg and went into the hospital. And about 20 doctors have examined me at one time or another, and no one has been able to come up with a definitive diagnosis. There are two possible diagnoses for which I have been treated uh, recently, uh, and we will see whether they have some effect on the result. But the basic result is that I do not have enough strength in my right leg to stand on it and therefore I am wheelchair bound and I'm hoping to, through therapy, to develop enough strength to at least be able to walk with a walker and even possibly walk with a cane and uh, continue to work on it and maybe at some point in the future be able to walk normally again. I don't know. 
but I do know that my wife, Pamela, and I have, <coughs> excuse me, my wife, uh, Pamela, and I have adapted mentally and physically to the situation so that we are doing fine, and so we've had to make a number of changes in our life. Uh, we had a house that had two stairways in it, and I can't get up and down those stairways, so we had to move into a much smaller house on one level. Uh, that's all right. It uh, prompted us to get rid of about two-thirds of the things that we had piled up in boxes and other places <laughs> and, uh, to make room for uh, to live in this uh, little house. And I actually like the simplicity of it uh, very, very much. Fortunately, my as far as I can see, others might disagree, but as far as I can see, my mind is not affected. And uh, uh, I can still write. I can still read. I can still talk. So the radio shows will no longer be interrupted, and my television show will continue. Last uh, weekend, I taped the first new episode in quite a while, and it went up on freemarketnews.com last Wednesday. Yeah, I saw that. And tomorrow I'll be taping a couple more that will be going up on the next two Wednesdays. So uh, the one thing that, uh, there's two things actually, where I have been interrupted is I have not uh, been writing articles lately, and I have not kept up with the journal. But I'm hoping that this next week I might be able to uh, begin getting back to doing some writing and getting uh, more articles on my website. Uh, the other area is in speaking. I just uh, do not think that I want to undertake uh, flying at this point in uh, the situation, and so I will not be traveling anywhere to speak. However, I will be uh, driving. Pamela will drive us to Atlanta the middle of October, the uh, third weekend in October, for the Advocates for Self-Government uh, 20th Anniversary Celebration, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. It's out in Freemire. I beg your pardon? I thought that... that um, oh, in the Freedomire. Freedomire, Freedom Freedom yeah. Yeah. If you go to advocates, uh, oh, no, what is it, selfgov.com, I'll put the link up on uh, the radio link page. Uh, you can see the link to the celebration. There's going to be a lot of very nice people there. Hugh Downs will be speaking, and uh, Ron Paul and a number of other people, and there will be an opportunity to meet and, and mingle with people uh, much like yourself and uh, have a good time. And it will be an opportunity for me to see a lot of people uh, to say hello to you or others. Uh, that I might not otherwise have a chance to say hello to. So I hope you'll give some thought to perhaps attending that. I think it will be a, a very, very uh, enjoyable affair. So anyway, what I'm trying to say is that uh, I appreciate all the good wishes that I have received, and I am very, very glad to have them, but I really do not need any sympathy. I am going to uh, live through this, uh, and I'm going to enjoy my life and foster If this is the way I will do the rest of my life, then so be it. If, I, if it turns out that I can do better than this for the rest of my life, even better, but it isn't necessary for me to enjoy my life. That's wonderful, Harry. So we'll be hearing from you. I'll be able to pick your brain for the next 20 years or so. <laughs> 20? Is that all you give me? <laughs> well, okay, that, I, was, I was being conservative. Yeah, the one thing that I regret is that I missed my high school's 20th anniversary reunion, and I missed the 30th reunion, and I was looking forward to the 55th reunion. I hate to give my age away, but uh, in Los Angeles, uh, the 1st of October, and I just decided that trying to fly to Los Angeles was too much, and... I got a list of all the uh, attendees that had signed up, and here were all these people I knew in high school, old friends of mine, and I, I really regret that. So that's the biggest loss I've suffered so far. So that, and I can I can stand that. Anyway, Gordon, I appreciate your concern, and uh, and uh, I, uh, I I'll, I'll, if there's any drastic change in, in uh, the situation for the better or for the worse, I'll try to let you know. Okay. Well, thanks for reassuring. I, I hope you're you're able to uh, recover quickly and do everything. You did. Thanks again, Harry. Thank you so much. All right. Now back to to uh, worst time with Jose Padilla. Um, I mentioned that uh, uh, Padilla was uh, identified as an enemy combatant without charging him as a crime. Uh, and then in February, the federal court in South Carolina ruled that the Bush administration couldn't legally hold Padilla as an enemy combatant if they didn't charge him with a crime. But now the Fourth Circuit of Appeals has overruled a basic tenet of American constitutional liberty. The very one of the most basic tenets, and that is the rights of the accused. That no one can be held without uh, charge. No one can be held without uh, a warrant or the grand jury being presented against them. And yet, with the Padilla case, we've seen the Bill of Rights and due process just cast aside. All right, there's an interesting thing here about the Roberts case, about Roberts' uh, nomination for the Supreme Court constitutional law that I want to make. But don't go away. This is Barry Brown. We'll be right back. And just to finish up the Padilla thing, the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals ruled that since President Bush had named Padilla as an enemy combatant, he could be held. Now, the interesting thing is, they didn't go into the Bill of Rights at all. They didn't discuss the Bill of Rights at all. All they wanted to know was, did the authorization for the use of military force joint resolution, which was passed by Congress three days after the September 11th attack, was that sufficient to allow indefinite detention? 
In other words, did Congress pass a law authorizing the president to be able to name somebody an enemy combatant and throw, throw him in the brig and throw away the keys? That's all they wanted to know, not whether it was constitutional, not whether it was a violation of the Bill of Rights, not any of this. And this is where we get into this business of conservatives wanting Congress to be able to legislate, that the courts should keep their hands off of Congress. And if Congress authorizes it, then the president can do it. And the decision said the question the president is unquestionably authorized by the AUMF that's that law to detain indefinitely anyone he declares an enemy combatant. And the uh, uh, the judge uh, Judge Ludig uh, recited the his activities, uh, but that was pointless because the court provides no standards for making somebody an enemy combatant. The memorandum designating to be an enemy combatant is reprinted in its entirety in the decision. In it, President Bush states that he has determined that the DIA, quote, is and at the time he entered the United States in May 2002, an enemy combatant. And, uh, quote, setting this declaration out as a preamble to the litany of the DIA's suspected activities. So Judge Ludick, who wrote the decision, would have us believe that the framers of the Constitution wasted those hot summer months in Philadelphia back in 1787, hammering out a social charter that could be abrogated on the whim of one single man when, in fact, the entire purpose of the Constitution was to prevent such a piece of power. And those words, those last few sentences, are by Tom Dorman, uh, who wrote uh, about this in Counter Punch. All right, let's go back to the phones and talk with James in Nebraska. Good evening, James. Hello. I was uh, wondering if I get, could you get some comments on the recent uh, Carter-Baker uh, voter ID. Yes. Yeah. yeah, there was a commission to uh, for campaign reform to try to, uh, you know, to uh, end campaign abuses and all this and that and so forth. Uh, there's a great deal to it, but, you know, to me, it's all uh, much ado about nothing, because the fact of the matter is that it's still a two-party system in America, and no matter how they do this, no matter what ID they ask for or don't ask for, whatever uh, they say, whatever they do, it is still going to be a two-party system, and no third party need apply. And uh, so I treat the whole thing as irrelevant, and I hate to be uh, to seem flimsy about it, but I just don't see any point. As long as third parties are ruled out of the, the democratic process in America, I don't see what the point is in getting exercised about any kind of uh, technicalities in the voting laws. Uh, what do you think? Well, yeah, that was my thought also. I just I haven't heard any excessive commentary on it. I was just wanting to get your opinion on that. But, yes, as long as we're uh, still voting on the same two parties, it doesn't really matter whose photo was on the ID. Yeah, and it doesn't matter uh, who gets the edge because of the voting machines or anything else. Uh, I, I, I just don't find any interest in uh, hoping with any of this stuff or investigating any of this stuff. It, it just means nothing to me, and I know a lot of people are really exercised about the, the voting machines to think that they're uh, an opportunity for fraud in the electoral counting and so forth, but uh, I don't really care. You know, I don't care whether Kerry gets elected or Bush gets elected because it's both and they both mean the same thing. Yeah, I agree. It seems like the Democrats are all up in arms. I think it's a big Republican plot to, to cut out certain certain voters of different ethnic groups in, uh, you know, different regions, but, um, you know, it's <laughs> still the same vote. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. All right, anything else on your mind, James? Oh, that's it. Okay, thanks for calling. Thank you. Uh, you know, getting back to Iraq, uh, it's interesting that recently the, uh, the, the six governments made a deal on North Korea, six governments being North and South Korea, China, Japan, the United States, and uh, who's the other one? Soviet Union? In any event, they made a deal that uh, North Korea will give up its nuclear weapons program and uh, it will, in exchange, receive a lot of money from the United States that will receive help with its nuclear power program. It will receive all kinds of goodies. And I can't help but think how much better off Saddam Hussein would be today if he had found some weapons of mass destruction, maybe bought them from Pakistan or, or uh, got them from Iran or from North Korea or some way, got some weapons of mass destruction into Iraq so that he actually had them, and then said, okay, let's have a meeting, let's have a, a conference on this, and I'll give up my weapons of mass destruction if you give me a bunch of money. He'd be still living in Iraq in one of his golden palaces. In fact, he probably has two or three more golden palaces now because of the money he'd get from the United States of America. But instead, he chose to tell the truth. And the funny thing is that when all is said and done, when the dust is clear, Saddam Hussein was telling the truth. He did not have weapons of mass destruction. He issued a, a report. I believe it, it was at the beginning of 2003, in January of 2003, in which he laid out all of his weapons programs, what happened to them, uh, where his chemical and biological weapons went and all of these things, it turned out that what he was telling was the truth. George Bush probably never read the report. He probably never even asked somebody to read the report for him. He just simply dismissed the whole report as a pack of lies. Well, you can't believe anything Saddam Hussein says. But in fact, Saddam Hussein was telling the truth. Hussein was telling the truth, and Bush was lying. 
Bush was lying when he said he had certain evidence that Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. And it seems to me a pretty sorry mess when a brutal dictator like that Hussein can be believed and your own president can't be believed. That's the way it turned out. And we had a nice question from Tom outside. It's not a question. He says, when George W. attacked Afghanistan, I told a group I worked with that we should not be going there because they hadn't attacked us. I was looked at in disbelief. What do you mean, they asked? I tried to explain that the country and people of Afghanistan did not bring down the World Trade Center and that we would be killing a lot of innocent people by going there. But one woman replied angrily, we had over 3,000 innocent people killed in the U.S., so I think we should be able to kill at least twice as many innocent people there. He actually said that. All I could reply was that it is never right to kill innocent people. I didn't know what else to say. I just didn't bring up the subject with her anymore. Well, I know how you feel. At a time like that, your patriotic motives are brought into question. You uh, are thought to be anti-American. Uh, you are thought to be living in a fantasy world. You've got to get into the real world where uh, real politics uh, exists and where uh, you have to deal with things as they are, not as you wish they were, and on and on and on and on and on. So I... Uh, I sympathize with you. Um, Jerry, out in Florida. Just glad to hear you're back in the air. I've been listening to your show since after the 2004 elections when I decided the Democrats were no longer a real opposition party and wanted to find an alternative. My question is this. As I'm researching the Libertarian Party and its principles, I've been checking out different Libertarian websites and blogs, and it seems that many are more like Republicans in their views than Libertarians. A difference of opinion is understandable, but some contradict Libertarian principles greatly. Have you noticed this as well? What is your perspective on this? I realize this isn't related to what you're talking about right now, but perhaps you could answer this on another show. No, it is related to what we've been talking about tonight. And uh, Jerry says also, if you're looking for an alternative to the mainstream news, Democracy Now! at www.democracynow.org, it's an excellent show. It seems to be the only news show that asks the tough questions and does real investigative reporting. All right. Uh, well, Jerry, yes, I have noticed, of course, that there are a lot of uh, apparently libertarian sites that are echoing the Republican line. There is one very, very prominent talk show host who calls himself a libertarian continually, who thinks George Bush is doing a great job out there, and that uh, the war in Iraq is the greatest thing since white bread, and on and on and on and on and on and on and on. And so, uh, uh, yes, there are uh, people who believe that the drug war is wrong, that the gun laws are wrong, that a lot of other things are wrong, just as libertarians believe those things, but get hung up on war. War is a very, very difficult subject for many people. I don't find it difficult because war is just another use of force. And war is just, as Joseph Stilton said, war is just one more big government program. And if people would realize that, they would be a lot more skeptical about it. In any event, uh, you have to pick and choose among these. You have to take what you can from uh, these sites if you find something good in the sites and enjoy it. Uh, but, of course, as you point out, you can't expect everybody to agree with you on every aspect of everything. Of course, you can agree with me because uh, I'm right on everything. But other than that, I understand the situation. Jeff Jacoby is one of those who is, uh, he's a writer, uh, he writes for the Boston uh, Globe, and he's a, uh, calls himself a libertarian frequently, and uh, he is very libertarian on a number of issues, and uh, on a number of specific issues, such as supporting the repeal of the state income tax in Massachusetts in 2004, and uh, in a number of other ways. But he is also a big booster of the Iraqi war, and probably of George Bush. And today he came out with an article, or at least I saw it today, uh, touting a website called uh, Good News from Iraq, that you didn't know there was any. Uh, the first installment came out in 2004, and what it was was a list of all kinds of good things that are happening in Iraq. And the idea was to offset what they call the grim litany of insurgent violence, Abu Ghraib, prisoner abuse, and coalition casualties that the mainstream media's coverage of the war tends to dwell on. In other words, it isn't all bad news from Iraq. There's all kinds of good things happening. And in this first installment of the good news from Iraq, it proclaimed that there was news to cheer. The democratic election of town councils in Zigar province. The publication of 51 million new bath free textbooks for Iraqi school children. The brain drain in reverse that was bringing thousands of educated Iraqi expatriates back to their homeland to teach. The revival of Kurdish music, long suppressed under Saddam. The reflooding of the ruined southern margin. So, what do we have to say about that? We'll be right back. To finish off what I said, uh, the good news from Iraq that didn't know any, this newsletter continued, it's actually a website, uh, continued as a blog, uh, and it actually expanded to good news from Afghanistan, too, and there are many, many installments of it written by an Australian. And where, 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 what are we missing here? Well, in the lengthy article by Jeff Jacoby, in which he uh, 
describes all these uh, things that uh, the author of this says, uh, there is no mention whatsoever of the cost of this, of the lives that were lost, of the fact that, or anything about what Iraq was like before the United States invaded it. Uh, Iraq had schools before the United States invaded Iraq. Iraq had textbooks, yes. They were uh, imbued with the party line. But then what kind of a party line are our textbooks imbued with? Uh, there is no sense whatsoever that there was any cost to this business, that the tens of thousands of people who died uh, died for any purpose whatsoever other than to make sure that Kurdish music could be played in the Kurdish section of Iraq. Uh, that's the problem, is that nobody recognizes death as a factor in any of this. And until we do that, until we recognize that violence is violence, that violence kills people, that violence is not the answer to our problem, we're going to continue to toss off all of these things as though they are just spoofs, as Wolf Blitzer had to say. And I refuse to do so. I may not be heard. I may not be able to speak loud enough. But I am certainly not going to stop calling attention to the fact that force is not the answer to our problem. The answer to our problem is persuasion. The answer to our problem is goodwill. The answer to our problem is benevolence. The answer to our problem is cooperation. The answer to our problem is providing incentives to profit-seeking individuals. The answer to our problem is never force. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. I look forward to talking with you again next week. This is Harry Brown.